When you come down to the nitty gritty of body composition and you need to be like a certain percentage of body fat for a show or you need to count your carbohydrates because you're doing endurance training and you need to make sure that you're recovering after you know you're doing two sessions a day but for most of us myself included it does not need to be that complicated you yeah. know and you can be fit and healthy and also look great and feel great on a diet that is just solely built on lots of whole food ingredients um, getting in a good balance of protein carbs and fats and basically just moving more the advice is simple but because it, there's no magic bullet and there's no quick fix that's you know it's it's not sexy so it's hard to get that across Hello friends, thanks for tuning in. It's Mike Motzel with High Intensity Health. I'm really excited to be here with Dr. Hazel Wallace. She just came out with this great book called The Food Medic, which we're gonna dive into today. And Dr. Hazel, I think what's really unique about your approach is we're not focusing on calorie counting, looking at macronutrients so much as to, you really guide readers to navigate, um, like to get more intuitive and to be more realistic and more like flexible dieting. So maybe before we launch with like all those details and things, I would love to know, you know share with our listeners your backstory, kind of how you got into maybe nutrition and then medicine. Okay, so I have an undergraduate like bachelor's degree in medical sciences, um, which I started when I was 18 years old. I'm originally from a small town in Ireland and I moved over to Wales to study that. It was my first time away from home, um, kind of like getting used to the university life, so I was not really cooking for myself. I was just like picking up food on the go, lots of takeaways, um, parties with my friends, and I guess I gained that, you know, notorious uh, freshers 15. Mm -hmm. And coming towards the end of my degree, I kind of like looked myself in the mirror, didn't really recognize myself. I'd gained a bit of weight, my skin was just really awful, and I didn't really recognize myself when I wasn't that fit, but I knew I wanted to do graduate medicine. So I was like, I'm gonna be a doctor, I need to get myself healthy, look healthy and feel healthy. So um, at medical school, you actually don't learn a lot about nutrition. So I didn't know a whole lot. Yes, I could tell you, you know, what a carb, fat, and protein was and where to find them, but I couldn't really, I didn't know how to apply that to everyday life, like how to build a healthy diet. Were you surprised by that? I was, and you know, I noticed that lack. Uh, so I kind of took it upon myself to do extra research and I started reading around the subject and applying it to my life and my diet. So my diet went from, you know, someone who's having really sugary cereals for breakfast, picking up a sandwich on the go for lunch, um, maybe takeaway in the evening, to someone who was cooking from scratch again, so eggs for breakfast, you know, chicken and veggies for lunch and a proper dinner in the night. Most, the biggest ch change I made was I was cooking from scratch and I was more mindful of what nutrients I was putting into my body. Um, I also started going to a gym and lifting weights and things like that. And I used Instagram as a personal platform to keep me motivated and keep me accountable to my new kind of healthy lifestyle, I guess. And from there, it just grew into a blog. And I started that four years ago and now I've got my first book. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm a qualified doctor, so I'm not a student anymore. Um, and it's even further kind of made me more passionate about my message and how, you know, my approach to how I, you know, I guess treat patients. So I like to have more of a holistic approach and I want to know what they're putting on their plate because food, you know, doesn't just make us look great and feel great, but it has the potential to prevent diseases and even reverse in some conditions, you know, across the UK, across the world, even in the US, we're dealing with things like obesity, high blood pressure, uh, high sugar, and a lot of that can be intervened and prevented with lifestyle and nutritional measures. But as doctors, we aren't focusing on that. And it's crazy because that's majority of our workload. Mm -hmm. So that's really the crux of the food medic. And the reason I wrote this book is because I just wanted to really dispel all the myths that are out there because I think in the wellness industry, there's a, like a lot of things flying around from people who are unqualified to give advice. And it's scary for someone who's n who doesn't really know much about nutrition because you can easily get caught up with this and think, oh, that's 
you know, I should cut out gluten from my diet or I'm going to go low fat because this person told me that's the best thing to do. So I basically just stripped it back and I go through nutrition, like what's carb, where can I find it, what are the best sources, how much should we be having, same with proteins, fats, and also discuss a little bit about how food affects the different systems in our body, so our brain, hair, skin and nails, our gut health, which is a huge area, as you know, at the moment, um, and uh, also our cardiovascular system, which is probably one of the most researched areas when it comes to nutrition. So there's a lot in there, and obviously I've got tons of recipes as well, and fitness, because I'm a personal trainer as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. But there's a few things I want to tease out about that last thing that I think is, is really important, and that's using Instagram as like an accountability partner. Yeah. So I think I've noticed, and maybe it's just, I thought it was just the population that likes to use Instagram. They tend to be more into fitness and like nature and health. And I wonder, I've thought about this, that Instagram or social media in general can be almost an accountability partner of sorts. And we know that a lot of people need coaches and trainers and, and, that, and that's helpful. But having like your social network, 500 friends or a thousand, whatever, it is to like comment and engage and then you kind of take ownership with that so you found that that really kind of helps you in your progression of like optimal health I yeah I, I definitely think it kept me motivated and on the days that I didn't feel motivated you know it was just like scrolling through Instagram to get me give me inspiration and I hope that people come to me for that inspiration now and that motivation on that same breath I do think that for some people they can become very fixated on that kind of whole community and they become so obsessed and that's all they're seeing on their Instagram feed so they're just thinking about food all the time and that can be un unhealthy in some, in some people and I think if you are using Instagram as a tool to keep you inspired don't just follow people for food advice follow people for lots of different advice you know like you know if you're looking at a yogi for some kind of like I guess inspiration to train or mindfulness. Um, I also I follow lots of chefs for like food ideas. Um, not necessarily healthy chefs, but just because I'm big into cooking and I'm I, I'm a novice when in the kitchen. So it's for me that's really inspiring. And I follow a lot of travel bloggers because I'm really big into traveling. And I think having you know that kind of variety on your feed helps to keep you a bit more centered. Yeah. Um, so more balanced, sort of speak. More speak. balanced, yeah. yeah, definitely. Because, yeah, you definitely can be kind of myopically focused if you want to or tend that way for fitness or whatever. And uh, and then you start, like we talked about, things that you talk about in the book to not do, like calorie counting and tracking every macro. Uh, we we're talking offline about that, how unless you're going to be a fitness model or a bodybuilder or you're a paid uh, model of sorts, like it doesn't really the quality of life doesn't improve by tracking every little macronutrient. No, it really doesn't. It's, you know, like, that's when you come down to the nitty gritty of body composition and you need to be like a certain percentage of body fat for a show or you're, you need to count your carbohydrates because you're doing endurance training and you need to make sure that you're recovering after, you know, you're doing two sessions a day. But for most of us, myself included, um, it does not need to be that complicated, you yeah. know, and you can be fit and healthy and also look great and feel great on a diet that is just solely built on lots of whole food ingredients, um, getting in a good balance of protein, carbs and fats and basically just moving more. Like it, the, the advice is simple, but because it, there's no magic bullet and there's no quick fix, that's, you know, it's, it's not sexy. So it's hard to get that across. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, right. And the results, if you do it the right way, are not necessarily instantaneous. They take time. And people just want that quick result, right? And so they, they can do. be frustrated. Yeah, yeah, they do. And I just tell people to give it time because once you feel the benefits, and I know myself because I've been, I've been that person who has been unhealthy, and now I feel really healthy. And once I felt that change, I never went back. And mm -hmm. like I get asked all the time, how do you, how do you stay motivated? And I'm like, once you try it, you'll, you won't ask me that question again because you've got energy to do it. Um, you know where you were and how you feel now. And it's, it's incredible. And it's, it fills you with confidence. You've got bounds of energy. Um, and yes, it, I don't like to focus on the whole aesthetic kind of side of things. But if you, if you start making these changes, your body will naturally adapt and you'll start looking stronger and feeling stronger and leaner. 
Yeah, brilliant. Going back to like the chronic diseases, so when you're working uh, your residency and rotations and things with patients, uh, you said you only have like a short period of time, five, seven, 10, 15 minutes in the States. That's the average, I think, 12 minute visits. Uh, what would you tell someone that was overweight and diabetic, like in that short duration? Uh, obviously, you know, your uh, superiors would want you to maybe use medicines and things of the sort, but what sort of the high hit rate dietary advice would you want them to know about? I think it's so difficult in that in that short period of time. And <clears throat> where we're first diagnosing this is in primary care, so at GP clinics, um, so like the practitioners in the community. And I think that's where we need to nip it in the bud because when they, by the time they come to hospital, it's not like it's too little too late, but it, they're coming because they're having symptoms from their diabetes, for example, or because they've got high blood pressure. So if we can kind of intervene in the community and get the advice in there, and whether that's the GP giving that advice, or I think it would be great to have nutritionists in those centers or dietitians, me personally, um, what advice I'd want to give them is to try as much to make them realize how much they can do for themselves to stop things happening in the future. So to let them know that, yes, your blood sugar is high and you're borderline diabetic, but if you change your diet, you have the potential to reverse that and you won't have to go on insulin in five years time. And I think giving people that ultimatum and kind of like power is a really big message. So um, it's difficult to change someone's diet in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but giving them small bits of advice and asking them to, you know, maybe this week, why don't you cook your meals from scratch or take your lunches to work with you? How about you walk 30 minutes every day, come back to me in two weeks and let me know how you're getting on, then maybe try another thing. And it's those little habits built up over time is going to make them he healthier in the long run. And those are things that you're doing in, in sh like in the r busy schedule of being a resident, right? I mean, you're bringing in your lunches and you're taking pictures of, of that and inspiring probably your colleagues and then patients as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's one of the big reasons why I've got such a large following because, you know, I'm working full time. Uh, I'm a junior doctor and it's a very busy job. <laughs> yeah. And I've also just written the book. So my time is, you know, I don't have m much time, but people are looking at me and they see themselves in me because they are also very busy. And I think they have the approach, if she can do it, I can do it too. And that's so true because we should all be able to, you know, maintain a healthy diet and lifestyle regardless of what job we have. And even in the book, the recipes that I've created, like I am no chef, but I've, I've designed every recipe myself and I wanted the ingredients to be really easy to get so you can get them in most supermarkets. Like you don't need to trek to any kind of specific health food store. There's only a handful of things. So I want people to open the book and not think, oh my God, this is gonna take me forever to cook. Um, and also really colorful, really nutritious, but also really tasty because I think another thing um, about healthy eating is that people think it has to be boring, like chicken and vegetables and sweet potato. And it's just like the same thing over again in Tupperware boxes. Like I want people to open their lunch boxes and feel really excited to, you know, to, to dive in. And I feel like that a bit about my lunches. So I think it's just inspiring people to get back in the kitchen and start looking at food from, as something that can really maximize their health and not something that they're using as a tool to restrict themselves. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at it because if you think about like taking something out, restricting, avoiding this, avoiding dairy, no more sweets, like people feel like they have to give up too much. But if you add in the healthy things like you're saying, I think it, from a mental standpoint, it seems a lot easier to do. Yeah. How much time would you say do you spend on meal prep? Like tomorrow is a busy day for you, right? You got the book launch, you're going to be busy all night and so forth. Um, would you spend like 15 minutes, 10 minutes? Like how would you do that? Um, so tonight I'll go home um, and I'll probably cook up some chicken breasts and some roast some vegetables and maybe some sweet potato so while that's cooking i'll get on with like my emails and doing other things so that you know in terms of cooking time that will take about 25 30 minutes but really it's going while on i'm side. doing that i'm doing other stuff sure. so it doesn't really take that much time at all then i just chop it up and put it into a lunch box um i'll bring my either make my breakfast in the morning if i've got time or at the moment, I'm a surgical rotation, which is uh, starts really early for ward round. So I tend to bring like empty peanut butter jars with filled with oats, and um, I make that the night before and just take it with me on the go. Maybe add some fruit to it in the morning. Um, then I've got my lunch that I've already made, 
and when I come home, I'll cook. And I'm the type of person that will cook every night, regardless of what time I get home at. Because mm. for me, it's like my time to like decompress from the day, tie up my hair, put on some music, forget about what happened at work. Um, and I think using kind of cooking as a relaxing tool is also something that's really important because when we put time and energy into food, we're more mindful about what we're eating. And at the moment, a lot of people just use food as something that's like fuel just to get them by. Yeah, like but filling up your car or something. Yeah. Right? yeah, and I mean, food is fuel. It's really important. It fills you with lots of nutrients, but we want to enjoy it. Like it's a social occasion. It's a family. It's everything. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, I don't want people to, to look at my book and think that, you know, food is kind of like a part of the formula. Yes, it is. But like, it's something that's part of your life as well. It's part of everyone's life. We do it every day. Yeah. I like that mindset shift of, of making like cooking kind of a, a de-stress moment, you know, to yeah. actively kind of calm down, which we all need to do. And there's yeah. a lot of good research there. Um, so I love your approach because you're really well balanced. And uh, so many questions I get on Instagram as well, like carbohydrates, protein, like wh what meal should I have before working out after you're very physically fit. You've been training for a while. Um, what tips do you offer to people when they say like, should I restrict carbs, go keto? Um, what about post-workout nutrition? Like I'm sure you get those questions a lot and I know you talk about it in the book, but if we can kind of summarize. Yeah. Uh, so basically, like I said earlier, I've got a very balanced approach to uh, nutrition. And um, when it comes to nutrient timing, I don't really think that we need to focus on that unless again, we're performance athletes or wanting to jump on stage. Um, if you're training, you and you're, you're looking to build some muscle, you need carbohydrates and protein uh, in your diet. But in terms of timing, if you um, are training in the morning and you haven't eaten all night, so as most of us would be asleep, you get up, you haven't eaten, I would say it's it, those are the times it's important to make sure you get in some protein before you train. So I usually have a protein shake or you can take BCAAs if you want to. Um, because that just means you've got amino acids circulating in your bloodstream and it kind of maximizes protein building. And afterwards, I would say to have a meal that's rich in protein and carbohydrates. But saying that, if you're training later in the day, say you're training two hours after lunchtime and you've had a good lunch, you've had some chicken, some sweet potatoes, some vegetables, you've got some good carbohydrates and protein. You don't need to really worry about getting in anything else before then because you know you've got a good meal still circulating in your bloodstream um, and then afterwards you you don't really need to jump in and have food straight away i think there's this whole misconception that you need to get like your protein shake in bam once the last dumbbells hit the floor mm -hmm. you have to be having in it. your locker go yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that's not true um again once you've had protein i guess in the three hour peri workout window i would say mm -hmm. is a good time so i either make sure i've had a good meal before or a good meal after and I don't faff about it too much. Yeah, brilliant. One of the myths you talk about in the book is that carbohydrates at night will make you fat. Mm. And so let's talk about that because I think a lot of people are scared of carbohydrates in general because of whatever. But we know that, and there's a lot of, Alana Cullen, I don't know if you know her, she's a researcher here uh, in the UK. And you know, talking about how low carbohydrate diets can sometimes shift the microbiome. You mentioned gut health. So should people be scared about carbs at night? No, I mean, your body can't tell the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there's this kind of, idea that when you go to bed um, obviously things slow down and your digestive system slows down and people think well if I'm not moving then the carbohydrates I've had are just going to turn into fat and stick x y and z on my leg on my bum wherever um, but the thing is your metabolism is always running around in the background where you don't even realize when you're sitting here your eyes are like moving they're blinking that's that's using energy. When you sleep, you're using energy, you're burning calories. We're burning calories all the time. Yes, when you're moving about, you're more metabolically active. Um, but carbohydrates will be used up throughout the night and the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so they stay there within your stores. And it, the, you don't need to kind of time your carbohydrates. I always say just space them out throughout the day. Don't worry about it too much. A lot of people who work shift patterns worry that they are having their dinner too late at night and ask me about that and I tell them again like it doesn't matter you know like if you couldn't make your dinner at six o'clock because you're still in work you have to have it at eight or nine o'clock that's fine it might be a good idea to maybe have a bigger lunch and have a lighter dinner if you find that because you're digesting it keeps you awake because that's the only real thing that I would tell people to not eat late at night because 
your, your body's just digesting it and it can yeah. keep you awake a bit but yeah. Really good tip. Uh, what about gluten? So I know gluten's pretty controversial. Mm. And you talk, talk about in the book that you don't necessarily need to avoid gluten if you don't have celiac and other issues. And I know that, at least in the US, I, I would find there's a higher prevalence of gluten sensitive individuals and the food quality is not so good as in Europe and so forth. So what have you found with the whole gluten-free thing and body composition issues and weight loss? So there is no evidence to say that going gluten-free is healthier. Um, and I make that very clear. I've looked at the evidence quite a bit and I know there's a lot of books out there that will tell you otherwise. Um, but if you have a gluten intolerance, uh, whether that is something that you feel on a personal level or you've been diagnosed, I'm not a huge fan of uh, food allergy tests um, or intolerance testing because there's a huge variety in terms of their kind of specific specificity. Um, but especially if you've got celiac disease, and that's when you've got an autoimmune disease to gluten, I would say they, those are individuals that can't digest it or have a problem digesting it to avoid gluten because it's causing you issues. But if you can eat a slice of bread and you have no issues, then do not cut out gluten for health reasons because it's unnecessary. And also I find that when people voluntarily go gluten-free they tend to go for the foods that have they're packaged and they've got gluten-free written on them but they they're processed foods and they're full of other stuff to make up for the gluten that's not there so you can like by default make your diet less healthy because you're going for all these fast kind of foods um so i would say unless you really cannot tolerate it don't cut it out. Mm -hmm. And it's just stick to mostly vegetables, green leafy vegetables and things anyway. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, like a lot of people tell me they've got problems with bread and like mm -hmm. I can completely relate to that. But I think that's because the bread that we tend to buy and that's more readily available is not fresh from a bakery. It is like processed and manufactured in a certain way that it will stay on the shelves for a whole month. And it's so refined and there's so much stuff in there that that can cause digest digestive problems for people. So I always say, okay, how about you try buy some fresh bread for a week and tell me how you feel or try baking yourself. Like mm -hmm. recently I've started baking and I'm really big into sourdough and things like that. And it's made a huge difference to me. I didn't think I could eat bread um, and now I love it. And it's just that difference in the quality of the food. That's brilliant. And I have a lot of practitioner friends that are doing the same thing, like sprouting yeah. their own grains, making their own bread and all that. I so, know. It's it's like the renaissance of bread making. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's great. It's really cool. Uh, last myth I want to talk about, you talk about in the book, and that's that eating multiple meals will make you, your metabolism speed up somehow. We hear this a lot. Like you just got to kind of stoke the fire, like have multiple meals. What's up with that? Um, so again, I think, like you just said, it comes down to the whole theory that when you're eating more, it's like, you know, keeping your metabolism high and it's true that some foods require um you know they use up a lot more energy to burn off so like protein for example uses up a lot of energy to digest um but the thing is eating overall the what really matters is how many calories you're consuming in the day whether that's in three three meals or six meals it doesn't matter and i think some people can fall into the trap of thinking if I eat uh, little and often, then I will lose weight. But if you're eating, you know, six relatively sized meals a day, you can also run yourself into kind of the risk of eating a lot more calories than you would be if you're eating three good meals and maybe two snacks a day. So I, I think this comes down to personal preference. Um, me personally, I, I like to have three standard meals and just snack throughout the day. It, especially if you're really busy, I'm like, who has time to have six meals a day? And again, you have to be really smart in what sizes they are so that you're not over consuming calories. But in terms of ramping up your metabolism, it's not going to do the trick. So I wouldn't focus on it for that reason. Yeah, interesting. Uh, a Canadian physician, Jason Fung, he wrote The Obesity Code and a few other books. And he talks about how eating multiple meals like that spike your insulin and keep spiking it. So by the end of the day, the, the amount of insulin you've released and propensity to gain more belly fat because insulin promotes fat gain. So, yeah. so it's kind of interesting that like we're, we're understanding the biology and going back to kind of the three squares a day and multiple people in different parts of the world are saying that, which is really cool. Yeah, I feel like we're really dead in full circle and going back to basics because there was a lot of noise created in the industry recently. Um, a lot of people, a lot of different opinions are out there. And I think it's you know up to people like myself um, who just want to 
be a voice of reason and be like, whoa, let's chill, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, we're making things too complicated. Yeah. Speaking of which, exercise has gotten really complicated. That's you talk a lot about in the book, and I know you're a personal trainer and so yeah. forth. Um, what when it comes to exercise, like keeping it simple and things, do you mix in like aerobics with your resistance training, or do you recommend doing like cardio then resistance? Like if you can kind of give us an overview of what you think is good for folks. Yeah, I think personally, again, I say don't. You know, once you're moving, that's the main thing. It doesn't matter whether you are love doing long distance running or you love lifting weights. Me personally, um, I really enjoy weightlifting. Um, I did some powerlifting in couple of years back and I've just kind of found my passion there and now I'm doing CrossFit but I try to do you know three days of of resistance training in the gym and my form of cardio because I really cannot do long distance running I've tried and I'm awful and I don't enjoy it so I'm like I'm not gonna put myself under that I really enjoy high intensity kind of intervals so whether that's doing sprints outside or on a treadmill um, and also kind of just doing body weight stuff I think we don't use our bodies enough um, in the book, I've got a, a kind of a workout section, but it's all at home and it's all body weight kind of like workouts, but people can create their own training protocols from what I've given them. Cool. So they kind of have the power to create that. And I think um, it's, it, it's again, going back to basics, like you find, I'll go to classes now and we're like, there's a lot of coaches who are going back to um, functional training and like moving like animals and I think that's really cool because mm. everyone can do that like not everyone can run a marathon not everyone can lift heavy weights so for me um, yes I really enjoy lifting weights but I also think that incorporating things like high intensity short breast training is really really useful especially if you're really busy and you totally. only have 20 minutes to get in get out or in between patients, go run up by the <laughs> stairs or something, yeah? Yeah, uh, I know. So the animal movements, I've noticed that's, I think, more of a UK thing. And like, it's, oh, really? it's coming, yeah, east to west. I've noticed that a lot, a lot of people in the States, ju- we're talking like deadlift squats, like bringing back some of the older bodybuilding movements for, for uh, you know, hormones and everything else and muscle mass. But the animal movements and mobility, I think, is stemming from here. A lot of practitioners here, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so some of the final questions that we have here is if there was just one exercise that you could do for the rest of your life, only one, what would it be and why? I would say a squat. Learn how to squat because that will teach you posture. Um, and you're engaging so many muscles of that. It's a, a compound movement, which means it's using more than two joints um, and more muscle groups. That, um, so it's a really great um, exercise to nail, mm-hmm. nailing it kind of body weight first yeah. and then moving towards weights, um, I think is, is a, an exceptional thing to do. What we like to ask this on every guest, if there was just one piece of health advice you'd offer to a parliament member, a politician for the World Health Organization, what would you tell them like in a lift or an elevator in like 30 seconds? I would say, you know, in the UK, we need to get a nutritionist into GP practices. Brilliant. Dr. Hazel Wallace, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really <laughs> no appreciate worries. that. No Thank you for having me. Where can folks connect with you online? What's the best resource? Um, you can find my website, which is www.thefoodmedic.co.uk. I'm also on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, all of the social media as at the food medic. And I'm on YouTube also. Brilliant. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And I'll put the links to Dr. Hazel's book in the YouTube description below.